Good morning. Welcome to the first uh, edition of Good Morning World for this academic year. Uh, this is a speaker series that Pitt University has sponsored now for a number of years uh, to bring a number of uh, very interesting speakers to our community, both for uh, people in the community. We have some community leaders with us today, as well as our students and staff and faculty. So we appreciate you being with us this morning. I think we're going to find this to be uh, especially interesting presentation. So with that, I would like to ask Ron Schumacher, who is Vice President for Development and Public Affairs, to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Marion. Uh, first of all, uh, Tiffin University this year is proud to kick off our 30th anniversary of doing Good Morning World uh, Breakfast Lecture Series in Tiffin, Ohio. Very happy to return to Camden Falls Conference Center this year. The Breakfast Lecture Series has been very successful. This has provided outstanding informational lectures to the local business and opinion leaders of Tiffin and our region. The series has also impacted the lives of our students at Tiffin University as well as those at Heidelberg University, <coughs> including some of the local high schools as well. So it's nice to see so many students here this morning and a big, big welcome to all the community leaders. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Thomas Barnett. Dr. Barnett is a grand strategist who has worked in national security affairs since the end of the Cold War. He is best known as the New York Times best-selling author of the Pentagon's new map, War and Peace in the 21st Century. He has also written Blueprint for Action, A Future Worth Creating, <coughs> and Great Powers, America and the World After Bush. Esquire named him the best and brightest in 2002, and he has also been described by US News and World Report's Michael Barone as one of the most important strategic thinkers of our time. Dr. Barnett holds a PhD in political science from Harvard University and is currently chief analyst for Wiki, Wikistrat he runs his own consulting company, Barnett Consulting LLC, and is a contributing editor for Esquire.com and writes a weekly column at, at the World Politics Review. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Thomas Barnett. Thank you very much. I'm gonna cover a lot of ground and I'm gonna to try to get done by nine, but if people have to leave at nine, that's fine. I may go a few minutes over. Um, I'm gonna describe the state of the world, it's an accurate title for the briefing, in terms of a series of flows. And when I describe a flow, I'm talking about a resource that's going from a region or parts of the world where it's in excess to regions and parts of the world where it's in deficit. I'm gonna talk briefly about the flow of people around the world through time I'm gonna talk about the flow of money. I'm gonna talk about the flow of energy, the flow of food and water, and then the one I'm most associated with, the flow of security, which is primarily a US function for the last 50, 60 years. So let's dive in. I'm gonna start off with demographics. And in each instance, I'm gonna link one of these flows to a part of the world. In this instance, I'm gonna link it to the Middle East. I like to read uh, science fiction because it takes today's problems, puts it into a different perspective. One of my favorites from my youth, a movie I just got it on Blu-ray not that long ago, looks fabulous, Soylent Green, a future in which we have so many people that we have to eat them. Now it's the year 2022, which is not very far from now. New York has 40 million people. This movie is uh, created in 1970, and they say right up front, we can't grow enough food for this world where New York has 40 million inhabitants, why? Global warming. They say it right then, in 1970. So they gotta eat people, there's so many of them. Movie that comes out, just five years deeper projection into the future, comes out about four or five years ago, Children of Men. Brilliant show. In this movie, women all over the world stop having babies, mysteriously. So children disappear population rapidly ages. And what happens to societies when you take children out of the equation? 
Now you'll say, uh, the first one, that does seem kind of incredible, sun and green eating people. Second one, though, not so incredible. Second one, I can show you now in Italy, Japan, places where the fertility rate is so low, they're closing schools across the landscape and children are disappearing, and the population stops thinking about the future in the same way when children are plentiful. And that's part of the crisis between the South and the North in Europe right now. So my short lifetime, I go from a dominant image, so many people, we gotta eat them. Where did all the babies go? Why are there all these old people hanging around? How does that happen so quickly? Human population stays around a billion people for quite some period of time. It hits the Industrial Revolution, starts taking off. By the time they do soil and green, the dominant meme is population's gonna be out of control. It's gonna be one of these Al Gore slides by the middle of the 20th century, 21st century. People projecting 20 billion humans around the planet, very frequently. But by the time they make children of men, we already know we're gonna top out as a species at around 9.5, 9.6, about the middle of the century. And that point going forward, they're not sure what happens. There's a supposition it'll just kinda hang there. It's so about nine and a half billion, and maybe start dropping. So that's a turning point in human history that'll be very deep and profound. You look at the mix of humans in 2000, and this is where we get into the economics. These are the people you love because they work. At that point, we got three times as many going in as coming out, <laughs> which is good because you lose bodies along the way. Now, if you know anything about math, this makes perfect sense. You get to 2050, that stays the same, but for the first time in history, the old start outnumbering the young, which is odd. It's ahistorical, it's not natural. The old should be hunted down by packs of wolves and the population thin because that's how nature works forever. Except we conquer this planet in a very profound way and on that basis we change it very dramatically. This is a world of half a billion elders that is a world of two billion elders in just half a century's time, a quadrupling of elders. My prediction, that is a crotchety, cranky, get the hell off my flaunt and lawn kind of world. <laughs> and it's gonna be different foreign policy. It's gonna be different ways of looking at the future. And that's gonna be where most of the money is. I'm 51, I worry about my PSR, I probably should worry about my PSA more, but the PSR, only the middle-aged guys in the room will get that joke. <laughs> PSR is how many people you got to take care of you when you're old. My wife and I had three biological children, so our PSR at that point was 1.5 each. Then we adopted, we weren't stupid, three girls from abroad. Now we have a PSR of 3.1 for both of us. We adopt girls because girls will take care of you. <laughs> you go back to 1950, the world, very agricultural, got lots of bodies for every retired person, 12 to 1. You go to 2000, we brought India and China on board, not so much of a drop, but look what happens by 2050. The assumptions of technological advance, productivity are vast. A redefinition of what it is to be old is assumed. And we're already seeing that pressure in terms of what's your retirement age? When should you collect Social Security? You've got a PSR globally of 4.1. It's going to be distributed very unevenly between a West, an emerging rising East, and a developing South. So here we are down to two to one in the West, merging kind of in the middle, and very big numbers over here. So I talk about Japan, fertility rate, PSR very low. You might assume a China has a very high one, and until very recently it did, but over the next five decades, China will resemble Japan in a blink of an eye. And it's one of the great challenges of getting old before you get rich, which we've never seen before in human history. I'll talk about that a bit more. So no question, bodies are gonna flow from the developing to the developed, and you're gonna have to keep sending jobs in that direction. So those pressures do not abate whatsoever. Now it's gonna seem like I'm switching gears to talk about religion, but I'm not. Religion throughout history is mostly about organizing humanity for procreation. Three major religions, all based on the Abrahamic tradition. What was the prime directive given to Abraham by God? 
procreate, 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 like the stars in the heaven, like the sands on the beach. Keep procreating. So religions organize us for that. They sanctify the whole process. They give us moral codes to proceed. All religions were created during the age of the Malthusian reality. Thomas Malthus argued, more bodies you have, more poor everybody is. There's only so much to go around. And if you look at human history, that held true. From 10,000 BC to 1800, it's all about population versus the limits of organic growth because we basically live on what we can dig out of the ground. So man's standard of living changes little. Man 10,000 years ago ate about the same number of calories, had the same number of sex, created the same number of children. Had a life expectancy at birth of about 25 years. That stayed the same to 1800. Really no change. Got better in the more advanced parts. But globally, it was stuck at 25. It was 30 in 1900. So the religious codes created during that Malthusian era, strict. All about survival. So very anti-gay, very pro-marriage between heterosexuals, very much about cranking babies, and very much about having enough labor to feed ourselves, which was tricky. But virtues during this time period a little counterintuitive. Anything that got rid of bodies, great. Not a problem. So war, for example, very honorable. Kills off population, the rest of us are richer in the process. You get to the mastery of inorganic growth with the Industrial Revolution, turns everything on its head. Buried lead of the 20th century, the doubling of human life expectancy at birth. 1900, it's about 32. 2000, it's about 65. We doubled life expectancy at birth in the 20th century. Not exactly what they write about in the history books. And how did we do it? Overwhelmingly, one thing, vaccines. You get a child to five, you change the world. So you go from how you survive to how you thrive. And all the religious code is severely stressed by that process. Meaning it's not a clash between civilizations, but one within civilizations. You take traditional societies, male dominated, from subsistence to abundance in a heartbeat, you're going from your given family to your chosen family. And that's most of the stress we call social issues. My favorite example, mass media. What is Tevye's problem in Fiddler on the Roof? What's the whole story? His daughters will not marry who he says. What's his one word explanation for everything? Tradition. Tradition. This is how we do it. I tell you who you marry. So you go from God's way to my way in a blink of an eye, you go from Muhammad to Joel Olstein very fast. <laughs> and that's revolution. But religion's still the key bridge for this journey, which is why we're going to have a very religious century. Do you adapt the ancient code to the new possibilities, or do you reject it as evil? If you reject it as evil, you're a fundamentalist. If you're Amish and you want to live in the 1800s, not a problem in America. If you're the Taliban and you want to live in the seventh century and you're willing to enforce that with weaponry, that tends to be more of a problem. If you want to connect, spread, globalize, tell everybody about your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you tend to be an evangelical. And what we know around the world is evangelicals are booming, fundamentalists are shrinking. Why? Everybody does want the same things, which is a slightly better life for their children. So I'm telling you this is going to be the most religious century we've ever had in human history. And I'm going to tell you that's a good thing. It's scary for the Europeans who are post-religious, not so scary for the US, which is still highly religious. But if you look at US history, every good thing that's ever happened in this country preceded by a religious awakening. American Revolution, abolition movement, progressive era, civil rights movement all started and led by a religion that became a competitor with the private sector and the government to deal with big issues. Most famously in the progressive era, late 19th century, we were dealing with a capitalism that seemed out of control and a lot of populist anger in our system as everything was coming together in new and unexpected ways across the vast continent, very similar to what the world experiences now. 
So when you have economic churn over time, lots of economic advance, what you tend to get is social anger on the heels of that. Why? Not everybody succeeds in the same way. You tend to rape the environment. You tend to be brutal to labor. The 1% tends to clean up. You want to drive that social anger down, you have to come up with political solutions. How we did this across the late 19th century is a model for how the world does it now. And we were growing. We were adding stars across those years. So the world, when you look at it today, where do you find the globalism, the strongest adherence to this process? Frontier markets. The Chinese love globalization a lot more than the Americans do. Where do you find the populism? They tend to be in red states. In America, in India, where a Naxalite Marxist insurgency is raging across the middle of the country. And in the interior cities of China, where you have 100,000 protests or riots every year. Where do you find the progressivism? Historically, who led the progressive era in the United States? It was New York City. It's the coastal megacities that tend to pull you along. That's where the innovation is. Coppers, cops, originally wore copper badges in New York City, which basically invented municipal policing, along with a host of other things that we now take for granted. So I talk about demographics, aging. I talk about religion on top of that. I put those two things together in the Middle East. I'll tell you, the Middle East right now is 22 years old. That's the center of gravity, mean age. When a population is 22 years old, its life is ahead of it. If you're in a traditional society, you've got one goal in mind. Get enough education, get a job, get some money, pay a dowry, get a wife, start a family. If you don't give them that opportunity, they're going to be pissed off big time. Because that's their just dessert. I'm going to tell you the Middle East, by 2030, is going to age to what is middle-aged in a traditional society, early 30s. That's the pressure you're seeing in the Arab Spring right now. They know they're not getting to 32 with the package they expect. This is the guy who started it all. BS in computer science. Can't get a job selling fruits on the streets of the capital in Tunisia. Gets hassled by a cop, refuses to pay the bribe, decides to turn himself into a suicide bomber. Being a millennial, he videotapes it. It goes on YouTube, it goes viral. When he's in the hospital, the president of the country doesn't usually show up for everybody who lights himself on fire, does, because he knows he's in a world of trouble. Three weeks later, he floods, uh, flees the country, and we got the Arab Spring, all because one guy is denied his vision of the future. And you really can't get any more apocryphal than that. A young man in a traditional society denied his future. The ultimate disconnect. So we talk about what's going on in the Middle East. We tend to blame radical Islam. We wonder if it was this guy and his crew. We wonder if our toppling of Saddam had something to do with it. We can blame it on the Iranians, blame it on our so-called addiction to oil, blame it on the Jews, historically, very nice target. Blame it on the former colonial powers getting involved in places like Libya. Are they going to go into Syria? We can blame it on the Wahhabists being promoted by Saudi Arabia. That's the traditional suspects. I'll tell you, none of them were decisive in this. They're all running to the sound of protest. I'm going to display a vast globalization conspiracy that's so complex, so meandering, I can't make this stuff up. Two guys at Harvard want to get laid. They create the Facebook, literally. Two pictures of two girls. You pick the one you think you'd rather have sex with. Bing, bang, bong, social network revolution is launched around the world. My 18-year-old son said, I wonder how many startups are started by young men trying to meet girls. I said, most of human history is young men <laughs> trying to meet girls. Nobody put this guy in charge on WikiLeaks, but the release of all that information was a huge trigger on the Arab Spring. Nobody told Anonymous, who came to this guy's rescue when Visa and MasterCard stopped processing uh, contributions, previous 18 months were training democracy activists online throughout the region. Nobody knows who they are, nobody knows how they train, but a lot of people know how they figured out how to use Facebook and everything else in the Middle East was because the anonymous guys and gals were working this issue. No one in charge. Nobody even knows who they are. 
Treasury Department, because of the housing crisis, floods the global system with money. We export our debt. We inflate everybody's prices dramatically. The US government, in a move of great foresight and wisdom, flooded the region with arms in the years leading up to the revolutions because we were worried about the Iranians and the locals were worried about the Iranians. The Chinese decided to increase their beef intake by 50% previous decade. Guess what that does to grain prices around the world? Toss in Mother Nature doesn't help grain prices. Toss in the Americans with the dumbest idea we've ever come up with. Taking one third of our corn crop and turning it into gasoline. We do that to protect ourselves from instabilities in the Middle East. What we do is we drive up the price of food around the world and create instabilities in the Middle East. I can't make this crap up, it's so stupid. <laughs> That's Iowa. Now let's talk about the Middle East, give you a quick primer on how things work there. It's all about Egypt, it's all about Saudi Arabia. Cultural center, religious center. You got non-Arabs, Persians, Shia, not Sunni like over here the Iranians. You got the Turks who used to run the place, Ottoman Empire. They're Turks, not Arabs, but they are Sunni, not Shia. Then you got Al-Qaeda, which started out targeting two regimes, Egypt and Saudi Arabia. So after we do our big shove and match throughout AFPAC, where are they having their center of gravities now? Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb targeting Egypt, Al-Qaeda on the Arabian Peninsula targeting Saudi Arabia. So the game has come back to where it started. Is my point. When we look at Egypt, where can it go? Best case, it looks like Turkey in about 10 to 15 years. Not so good, it looks like Pakistan, too much of the security controlling still. Worst case, it gets really radicalized, looks like Iran. A lot of people assume that's the Muslim Brotherhood path, that's the military running things. We're not quite sure what that looks like. I would tell you before, they kicked out the Muslim Brotherhood. I had the line right about here, now it's more about here. But why it matters is because this is the biggest Arab country in the region. So it sets a huge standard and it tips the balance between a series of rivalries that are raging right now. The one everybody talks about, well they should talk about, is between Iran and Saudi Arabia. The Iranians talk about the Jews all the time, the Israelis, but that's a complete canard. It's a red herring. What matters to them is Saudi Arabia. They can't say that, so they say it's all about Israel. When they talk about wiping Israel off the map, it's insert Saudi Arabia here. <laughs> and the Saudis know that, which is why they get so nervous. Big rivalry between the Turks and the Iranians, right now over Iraq, increasingly over Syria. And then an emerging rivalry between Egypt and Iran, historic rivals, who is the representative of Arab culture. It's a tough sell for the Iranians, because they're not Arabs. The real concern is, Iran controls Iraq, Iran controls Egypt, that was the Muslim Brotherhood fear. Everybody gangs up on Saudi Arabia. The Jews are caught in the middle, but it's always gonna be about Saudi Arabia. The trick is these guys had nukes. So the goal is, ultimately, to create an axis of good, a series of democracies that provide counterweight to the dominant rivalry in the region. Because we can't do much with the Saudis, we can't do much with the Iranians, Frankly, the Israelis don't do what we tell them, ever. Now the concern here, and the reason why you want to have that kind of balancing of players who are more accessible with the ones who are less accessible, these guys will get the nukes. The Israelis already have about 300 nuclear warheads, so they're not a small country in that regard. And the Saudis will cash in on a long-held, long-preferred promise from Pakistan to get nukes the minute the Iranians do. Then you move into a mutual assured destruction situation, not unlike Europe in the late 50s, early 60s. And we hope that learning curve goes well because there's a lot of hydrocarbons carbons in this part of the world. I'm gonna leave you on a happier note with the Middle East. I'm gonna predict the Mediterranean Union is gonna look suspiciously like the Roman Empire because the Mediterranean is not a barrier, it's a thoroughfare. I'm gonna give you one simple reason why this happens. Even though Christians to the north, Muslims to the south, these guys are short 100 million workers. These guys are short 100 million jobs. So you deal with it, you extend it, or they're gonna come across the water anyway. Now we're gonna talk about money and the China challenge. And as a former Soviet expert on the former Soviet Union, I find that connection odd. It's a lot of change in one lifetime. 
The ambition of the Chinese people creates a lot of envy around the world. Barack Obama says he wishes he could run the U.S. economy like the Chinese get to run theirs. Bill Gates expresses admiration. Tom Friedman expresses admiration. They all make it sound like the Chinese have done something we've never seen before in human history. It's a new model. It's not. Let me give you an evolutionary scale of economies. The most freedom limited, we're talking centralized socialism. That's the Soviet Union. You want to get out to that kind of boundary, it's usually through oligarchic capitalism. Elites control everything. That's the Middle East. That's where Russia is now. Okay, you want to move out even further, it's typically state-directed capitalism. You let private citizens own the companies, but they're told what to do under certain circumstances by the government. That's a classic Japanese South Korean model of 20, 30 years ago. You want to move from extensive growth to intensive growth, from more resources to productivity, innovation. Typically, you move in the direction of big firm capitalism, Madden in America, Europe today, where the Japanese and the South Koreans have migrated the last 20 years. You want to get way out there, be pure entrepreneurial. My current company, Wikistrad, is an Israeli startup. Almost every Israeli company is a startup that goes global because the market's too small. That's the entrepreneurial capitalism. Purest forms, small island nations. Classic example of a migration, Singapore from straight directed to entrepreneurial. Now everybody wants to be the new Singapore. Draw a line between these two, you have the hybrid, the Goldilocks. A mix of big go-to-market players in every industry surrounded by a sea of small entrepreneurial firms. As soon as they get a good idea, big player reaches down and buys them. So think of big pharma, think of information technology, where Google buys everything now or Pfizer. That's the US economy, okay? That's where people want to go. So let's look at the Chinese. They were centralized socialism under Mao. Deng takes them towards state-directed capitalism. What do we hear out of the Chinese? What do we see out of them? They want to go global towards big firm capitalism. They want indigenous innovation. They will steal everything they can in the meantime, but they want it. But everybody does this. The US was the biggest fever across the international system for the entire 19th century. And then we got rich and we started caring about the rules, which is how it works for everybody. <laughs> and they want to have domestic consumption-led growth. So they're trying to thread that needle and become a hybrid like the U.S. So not different, not a strange path, not orthogonal to human history. The biggest problem they face is the one we faced, the one that set off our progressive era, when 1% of Americans controlled about two-thirds of the wealth the Carnegie's and the Rockefeller's pre-income tax. China today, 1% controls 70% of the wealth. Global average is 40%, U.S. average 42%. You can't have it above 50%, it's just not possible. So when I talk about China ruling the world, I'm gonna tell you it's not gonna last too long. I give it about 15 years, maybe to 20, 30. And the perception now is China does rule the world. I'm going to give you five reasons why that's going to happen. First one's demographics, which is a hard nut to beat. The Chinese miracle is not unlike any other miracle that came before it. You want as few dependents as a percentage of working population as possible. Dependents are youth and elders. This is the Chinese situation. In 1965, 80% of Chinese do not work. I mean, some of them work, but not to the optimum, let's say. So what's the Chinese miracle from 1965 to 2010? They didn't get rid of old people because they respect old people. They got rid of kids. One child policy. Now you're down to 60% of the population working in 2010, but that turns out to be the golden year. You can only do this for so long because as you develop, even if you keep children depressed, what happens is old people start adding up. Better nutrition, better medical, everybody has longer, happier lives. That's the demographic dividend, this chunk right here. Once you start going up there, everything gets tougher and the labor advantage disappears. China will have as many elders as we have total citizens in 2050. So when the Chinese invade, we'll see them coming. <laughs> <laughs> and it won't be fast. This creates a dynamic inside Chinese society known as the 421 problem. Four grandparents, two parents, one child to rule them all because that kid is the social security network. You can see these chubby children walking down the streets surrounded by six adults shoving sweets in their face and making sure nothing happens to them. 
So those MIT demographers who say there's going to be 40 million extra Chinese males, got to put them in the military and have a war because you got to burn them off because that's how we do it in human history. That kid is not going anywhere. That's the bigger problem in the system. The Chinese aren't responsible for what happens in the world and need to become. Second big problem, decrepitude. This is Beijing on a clear day. I could show you this picture of London, 1870, New York, 1890. They all got better. Beijing will get better. It's the Kuznets curve, as they call it, in pollution. You get to a certain amount of GDP growth, you start caring about the air. But the Chinese have a bigger problem that they can't whisk away through policy so easily. 22% of the world's population living on 7% of the water. That is the Achilles heel of the system. We'll talk about that later. Dependencies. The U.S. has been the biggest importer of oil for a long time. Not surprisingly, we've got the world's biggest navy and military to protect that dependency. I used to say this was going to happen by 2030, and then I started saying it was going to happen by 2025. Latest prediction from OPEC is it happens next year. The Chinese are the biggest importer in the world because of the U.S. shale gas and fracking of tight oil revolution. We are now an exporter, net exporter of fuels, petroleum fuels, and we're predicted to be a net exporter of oil by 2030. So the Chinese become more defensive because of these dependencies. Earlier this year, they crack out their new design for a very sexy 21st century carrier. Almost the same week they come out and admit they have these fabulous carrier killer missiles, which is a little bit like coming out with the new body armor and the best body armor piercing bullets at the same time. But it gives you a sense of how nervous the Chinese are, are about their dependency, which is almost overwhelmingly through seaborne trade. Because China, thanks to Tibet and everything else, is really sort of an island. The only way you can get there most of the time is through the water. And that's the vulnerability. But the biggest problem they face is that we've never seen a polity get rich without going democratic. You can do it in small places, little kingdoms, but really hard when you put people in charge. The Chinese right now are right below that democratization zone. No question they're going to roll through it in the next 20 years. Because by 2030 they're going to have more like 20,000 per capita GDP. So the question of how and when China democratizes is one of the big variables in the system. China rules the world again, maybe 10 to 15 years. But China continues to change the planet in very profound ways. What the U.S. did with China at the end of the Second World War took a while for this pattern to become discernible, very much what we did with Europe. We took in their export-driven growth and we provided a leviathan service. I call it a transaction strategy. It was implicit, but it was very open. You sell us your cheap goods, we'll buy it. You take your trade surplus, you put it into U.S. debt markets, keeps our money cheap, we can have a big military, we'll look after you, so you can focus on your economic growth, sell us more stuff, we'll send you more money, you'll send it right back to us, we'll keep buying and we'll keep protecting. And that's what works right up to 2008. It wasn't a bad system. It created something that's never happened in Asia before. These four powers, all rising, all peaceful, all getting prosperous. Japan, Korea, China, India. It's never happened in human history until the Americans showed up and tried to make it happen. And we succeeded beyond our wildest dreams. And now we have Friedman's flat world. And we can't complain about it because we actually tried to pull it off. This is not going to go away for quite some time because this part of the world is still urbanizing in a big, big way. If you put ASEAN on at the bottom of this chain, that's your factory floor Asia for the last 30 years. What the Chinese did was they inserted themselves at the top of the assembly chain and consolidated, not expanded, consolidated an existing trade surplus with North America. That's how they got all those reserves really fast. It was smart as hell. China has to urbanize half a billion people, so they've got to have export-driven growth for a while. The other big impact they're having globally is the rise of South-South trade. China with Latin America, China with Africa. What this does is, if you start trading with China, you increase your trade with all of China's network partners, and by definition, you increase your trade with the world, which means the Chinese are the biggest spreader of globalization right now. They believe in capitalism more than we do, and they're the biggest propagator of globalization, which frankly was a U.S. conspiracy, hatched after the Second World War to finally fix it. 
So they're doing our work for us. Regional integration, they've added back their lost colonies. They're the biggest trade partners for Australia, Korea, Japan now. And they just concluded a huge free trade agreement with ASEAN. All this economic connectivity outpaces the civil, military, political mistrust. And yet we're seeing all sorts of new integration going about through the rise of globally integrated enterprises. This is Sam Palmasano's term as the successor to multinational corporations. You source, build, sell locally all over the world. Great model of this, Toyota. How did they get past being a foreign car in America? They make Toyotas in America. So if you want to succeed in globalization, you've got to succeed in the biggest market. GE partners up with AVIC, which runs the Chinese airline industry. They take on Boeing. They take on Airbus. GM, in the smartest move I've ever seen in the last 20 years, gets together with Shanghai Automotive Industrial Corporation. They are now the biggest sellers of foreign cars in China, which is the biggest market rising for cars in the world. So all this integration going on despite this political military mistrust of the Chinese. A lot of that has to do with a relationship that is still stuck in a Cold War stance. United States, China over Taiwan, we're forced to defend. They see it as part of their country. Then there's the seabed struggles coming along. Now the Americans have a particular rule set. We believe we should be able to put our carrier off your coast with enough firepower to destroy your country. And if you find that provocative, we have a problem with you. <laughs> the Chinese say, We'll blow up your carriers with our carrier killer missiles. Not only that, they've got an assassin's mace strategy. They're going to blind us in the opening minutes of a war. They're going to turn off all our satellites, everything else. We have a countering strategy called air-sea battle. We're going to blind the Chinese in the opening minutes of the war, which I think is perfect, because I want the two biggest militaries in the world, two biggest economies in the world, the fate of humanity run by two militaries blinding each other in the opening seconds of a war. Just shoot everything off. My fear is Archduke Ferdinand lives in Taipei, and my advice to this guy is, when you take the car out, for God's sakes, keep the top up. Because I don't want Taiwan to declare a war between the United States and China. And yet, stranger things happen in history. A lot of people make the comparison to 1914, when in reality, and I'm going to make this argument now, the Chinese and the Americans have a lot of overlapping interests in securing this world. We both need the world to be stable. China needs the world to be stable, otherwise China's not stable, and America needs China to be stable, otherwise the United States is not stable. That's deep interdependency. So let's talk about energy and how things change. I'm going to give you a quick primer. America is its own biggest source of energy. It's always been that case. Number two source, we get it from our friends to the north and south. Number three source, Latin America. Chavez talked a good game, sold us his stuff anyway. Now we got Brazil with the pre-salt deposits, we're going to get even more. Number four source comes from West Africa. Nigeria is a big source. Ghana is going to come on with the Jubilee field. Going to be almost as big as Nigeria in 20 years, which is huge. So where's the Middle East in this picture? Fifth most important source for us. Represents about 3% of our total energy use. Destroy the Middle East tomorrow, America adjusts. This picture is before the fracking revolution. We are importing 60% of our oil in 2050. We're down to 45% now. We're predicted to be a net exporter by 2030. That is a game changer. So where's all the Middle East oil go? It goes to East Asia, which sucks it from Africa, Australia, New Zealand, from Latin America, from Canada from the Russians. They're now the huge demand center in the global economy. Europeans draw it from traditional sources, and the Russians will sell you nuclear power plants, which is a scary concept. But my point is, demand center shifts from North America to East Asia. And it just so happens the two biggest consumers in the system magically discover in recent years they have the biggest shale gas reserves in the world the next move down the hydrocarbon chain. A progressive decarbonization from oil in transportation to natural gas. You ever been in a compressed natural gas taxi in the United States? Because they're popping up. We're talking about doing it to long haul trucking. And going from coal 
to natural gas and electricity generation. China's got the biggest in the world. United States, number two. Argentina, sometimes put as number two. Mexico, number four. South Africa's five, then you're on to Australia and Canada. Turns out two thirds of the world's shale gas reserves are in the Pacific Rim. So we talk about creating something that's a big new trade a relationship. It's not about shutting out the Chinese. Frankly, it should be about creating a co-exploitation strategy to shift us from oil, from coal, to natural gas. Because you really want to cut CO2, that's the quickest way you can do it. So when we talk about Africa, why is it that the Asians are coming there? I'm going to explain globalization as a series of successful replications. European construct tries to conquer the world with colonialization. Disaster everywhere except in a couple of key places, North America, one of them. We snap off the relationship as early as possible. We become the replicator in the 20th century. We replicate globalization in Asia. You could see this in the car, the sine qua non of industrialization. It's a French word, automobile. It's a German invention. Becomes identified with the United States in the 20th century. Now the car market, if you ever been to China, out of control. I could show you this in terms of the saturation. Europeans hate cars. They have 600 for every 1,000 people. America loves cars. We get a car for every American. The Asians only have 40 cars per 1,000 people. So who's going to integrate the developing parts of the world? It's not going to be Europe. It's not going to be the United States. It's going to be the Asians. That's natural. They're the last to join, the first to replicate. And they got a car for the process. It's an Indian car. It's built by the Tata Group. It's called the Nano. It's a piece of crap. <laughs> no power or anything. No radio. No air conditioning. Has a tendency to spontaneously combust upon operation. <laughs> <laughs> but if you've ever been in a third world capital and seen a husband, a wife, three kids, four chickens and a dog riding a motorcycle like a Chinese acrobatic troupe, <laughs> that is a slice of heaven for $2,000 and a great place to escape your parents and have sex as teenagers. <laughs> so where is going to be this east-west resource wars? I'm going to give you the game changer, fracking revolution. We are going to be exporting refined products to Africa because they don't have refining capacity. Ultimately, we're going to sell them modular refineries constructed in uh, Houston. I'd like to do some of that myself. We're selling natural gas in the next five to 10 years to Asia. And the clean coal that gets displaced here, higher caloric value, we sell that to the Indians and Chinese who want to get off the really bad stuff, which creates some particulate problems. We're going to lure uh, Latin America into a free trade agreement on the basis of the cheap energy we're going to unleash across the Western Hemisphere. And thank God, because of the water requirements with fracking, we're going to finally kill biofuels. So one technology, this is really Marxist, comes along, changes the base, and the superstructure is impacted magnificently. Gives you the power of innovation. So why this matters for Africa? Turns out the more squiggly the lines your country's borders, the safer you are. If your borders have straight lines, you've got a problem. If your borders are really squiggly, you're going to be fine. Why is that? Here's a classic example. This is the uh, 13th Congressional District of Illinois. Oh, there's a black person. We've got to draw a line around them. <laughs> Actually, that's Chile. That's the ocean. That's the mountains. It's totally natural. Here's my subdivision in Madison, Wisconsin. Total artificial construct. Actually, that's another totally artificial construct, Jordan. When Churchill creates the modern Middle East after the First World War, there was this chunk left over. And everybody said, what's that? Somebody said, a river runs through it. What's it called? Jordan. Let's make up a king. And they did. They created the Hashemite kingdom, which hadn't been around since biblical times. This is not a stable country. This is a country that won't change because it has geography. Squiggly lines are the best predictor of stability. Straighter your lines, more likely it is somebody else drew them for you and they're not natural. So here's Africa. Here's the underlying tribal realities. Here are the lines the Europeans drew. 80% of them oddly correspond to longitude and latitude, as if somebody took a ruler to a map, 
And the reason is they took rulers, two maps, <laughs> and drew countries. And the good countries are the ones on the outside because that's what gets you the port. And who got left with the middle? Were the Germans and the Portuguese. So when Portugal falls and its empire collapses in the early, mid-1970s, you get countries of socialist orientation, Reagan doctrine, the whole mess in that part of the world, and a lot of killing. About six to seven million dead in here last 15 to 20 years. Basically a holocaust, which history will judge us on. Here's a line that really matters, and it's based on geography. Here's the underlying vegetation. You notice something. There's green and then there's brown. Harsh climb, harsh religion. Easier climb, easier religion. That's your Muslim north. That's your Christian animus south. So where do you find instability in Africa? You find it along the fault lines. Countries that have split. Remember Sudan, it used to be one country. Now it's a Muslim north, Christian south. You read about Mali breaking up for a while there until the French came in and chased them out. Radical Muslim North triggered by events in Libya. Freedom fighters coming home. And here's the classic one, because it's so important to the global economy, oil, Nigeria, good luck. Jonathan wins a landslide, takes all the Christian southern provinces, doesn't win a vote up in the north. With Boko Haram, the radical Islamist insurgency rules to a certain extent through fear. Boko Haram means Western education is forbidden which I call truth and advertising. <laughs> and that's where Al-Qaeda is operating. I can tell you this is not a weird case. This can be shown through America's development. The original 13 squiggly line colonies, this is how we did the Trans-Appalachian West. Very simple, we drew a line called the Mississippi, and we drew a line called the Ohio River. The rest was straight lines, just. And those are the assumptions of the original colonies that they got Western expansion. Now look what happens when we do the American West, because we were in a hurry. <laughs> I'll show you the thought that went into the great <laughs> state of Colorado. <laughs> yum, 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 yum. Can you spot the Rockies? Can you spot the Lakota people? Can you spot anything there? No, we drew lines, we were in a hurry. The reason was, we were the rising China of our age late 19th century. We're exporting beer to Germany, like China exports tequila to Mexico today. So we were the rising China, and yet we had to integrate this crazy wild west. Not unlike a west integrating an east and a south today. And we're doing it because that's where the growth opportunities are. But here's the juxtaposition I want you to keep in mind. We're celebrating the centennial, 1876. We're about three years into building the Brooklyn Bridge, greatest engineering feat of the age. Still standing. You can walk across it. About 10 days before we celebrate the centennial, Custer buys it a little big horn. He and his troops are massacred in our federally administered tribal area, a place so dangerous we can't send our military. So we're not only the China of our age, we're the Pakistan of our age, and I guarantee you, if Crazy Horse could jump on a plane and go to London and blow up Big Ben, the Brits would have invaded, just like we went into Afghanistan, because that's how you deal with those problems. So this is not new history, this is old history. We saw this in the Balkans. Fake countries held together by external powers, globalization comes in, everybody wants a divorce. How do you make lines squiggly again? It's called ethnic cleansing. You may have lived here for 100 years, but unless you leave this afternoon and I get everything you own, I'm gonna kill everybody in your family. That's how you make lines squiggly really fast. And that's how they did it in Iraq. They redivided things. So Bosnia wanted out after Slovenia and Croatia wanted out, and then you had the big fight across the Balkans in the 1990s. The trick is to get them to realize their economic interdependency over time Mergers and acquisitions across the Balkans today, skyrocketing. Some of the best vacation properties you will find are on the coast of Croatia. Forget about it, actually go to the coast of Bosnia at this point. You wanna jump that chasm, typically your single party models. So don't wish for democracy too early because it tends to get bloody. My point in showing you this model, America gets called in when this happens. Guess who shows up when it starts to get good? The Chinese who have oil contracts in the north and south of Iraq, PLA deaths, People's Liberation Army deaths in Iraq so far, zero. 
We go into Afghanistan, China puts four billion dollars down on a copper mine. PLA deaths in Afghanistan, zero. Point is, we have different ways of looking at Africa. They're the biggest foreign direct investor. We created AFRICOM. Two different ways of looking at the world. The reality for Africa is you've got to connect the interior to the exterior. Why? That's the normal trade routes. You're going to see all sorts of fracturing of fake states. You want to have overarching regional economic groupings that allows that fracturing to occur and you can still have economic integration. You want to connect them to the coast because that's where the middle class population is concentrated. No surprise. Hence, again, the critical role of coastal megacities. Half the world's population, 80% of globalization. Coastal megacities. So Bloomberg, you can make fun of him, but he's actually one of the most interesting, dynamic players in an emerging global progressive era for all the reasons he cites, all the things he wants to fix. Now let's talk food. This is the most interesting map to me in the world because it's a lot more segregated than you'd think. You want to buy rice in this world, you've got to buy it from Asia. Nobody else exports, really. You want to buy sugar in this world, you're going to buy it from Brazil. Nobody has the capacity. You want to buy beef in this world, you're going to buy it from Australia, New Zealand, Argentina, Brazil, Chile. You want to buy dairy, the Saudi Arabia of milk is New Zealand. Why? You ever seen Lord of the Rings? It's a very wet place. You want to do dairy? It's got to be wet. Western Hemisphere, huge source of the things that basically feed the world. Soybeans, pork going almost exclusively to Asia, a big, huge flow. And then to the rest of the world, we export corn and poultry. Huge flow from north to south in terms of wheat. There you bring in the Black Sea region and then a huge aid flow. Turns out America is number one in soybeans, number one in corn, number one in wheat, number one in food aid. Biggest source of stability on this planet is U.S. farmer and ag corporations. Only about 10 to 15 percent of food crosses borders today, but you're going to have a huge uptick in demand. Not so much because of the population, but because the population moves into a middle class status. I make about 40 times as much money now as I did when I was a college student. When I was in college, I drank a lot of beer and ate a lot of pizza, because that's what I could afford. Now I drink scotch and smoke salmon. A lot more intensive in terms of the water and the labor and the energy that goes into that. That's the big challenge, is making Mr. and Mrs. Middle Class Chindia happy with their diet, because whatever they want, alters human history. The Chinese get turned on to peanuts recently. U.S. peanut market goes through the roof. So let's talk about where you can grow food. Where you can grow food is where you have excess water. Real simple. Food is excess water turned into human energy and moved in an easier form to move, because water is heavy. Europe, surprisingly not so good. Africa, surprisingly good. Problem is it only rains twice a year. Australia and New Zealand, you've got the big vast deserts of Australia, but the coast and then New Zealand, huge amounts of water relative to population. Here's the problem in the system. 60% of the world, Asia, living on barely one third of the water. And here's the hidden surprise at the bottom of the cereal box. Western Hemisphere, we got three times as much water as we need. So where can you get exportable grains? Real simple, where the water is in excess. This Black Sea region, South America, and then the King Kong of grain, North America. We dominate grain like we dominated cotton pre-Civil War. Rest of the world, imports. And this is how we feed ourselves. So when Asia wants more beef, guess what happens to the price of bread in Egypt? It doubles in the 12 months leading up to the revolution. 80% of household budget in the Middle East, food. 80% of the food in the Middle East, imported. That's vulnerability. Climate change on top of this, it all gets exacerbated. Where you can grow food now, above and below 35 degrees, not a problem. Where you can't grow enough food now, it's going to get dramatically worse. Turns out that's where your water shortages are now, and that's where virtually all your population growth is. 
Middle Earth is in for a tough time. Here's China, here's India. Too much of it caught in this ban. Guess what? The Chinese have to become friends with the Russians, and you're going to have the Indians pulled into the Anglosphere. Because the future is about having friends in the north. That's where the arable land is, that's where the water is. So what this is going to mean for the Western Hemisphere? Right now, America. You have seven Americans, one of them is Hispanic, and we're freaking out about that. You jump ahead to 2050, one out of three Americans. That's a very different America. Much more open to the concept I'm going to lay in you right now, which is going to sound crazy, but it ain't. America is unique in human history. We've added stars throughout our existence. We just got stuck on 50 for some reason. First Barnett who comes over, fights with Washington. They couldn't afford any stars in their flag. All they could afford was a cut up dead snake. <laughs> His son starts off with 13 stars. His grandson, all the way up to 24 stars. His great grandson, my great grandfather, this to me is fascinating, born under Lincoln, dies under Truman. Born in the Civil War, dies at the start of the Cold War. He starts off with 35 stars, he loses a few, has them forcibly added back, and 13 more on top of that. That's an interesting life. Here's my grandfather. He gets five stars added to a flag across an 80-year life. Here's my dad. He gets only two stars. Here's me. I got bupkis so far. <laughs> I'll be the first Barnett to be born and die under the same flag. And it turns out Barack Obama will be the first president to ever suffer that fate. So here's my prediction. More like 70 stars before we go. I'm talking about inviting the Calgary and Alberta down for a beer. They don't like Quebec any more than we do. <laughs> Mexico's already given us 10 states. Frankly, they could give us another 10. We already have them in our economic union. They vote in our elections and in their elections, and for some reason we're still fighting a drug war on their border, which is nutty. And we have dollarized economies throughout Latin America. Why are they going to come? Climate change is going to be devastating to the North Andes and to Central America. So the pressure for population growth is going to be there. But there's also a reality, and you saw it in USA Today yesterday. They showed you how corn and soybeans are migrating northward in America. Here's what's going to happen to wheat. This is where we grow it now. This is where we grow it in the middle of the century, in Alaska. That's different. You want to invest? I say buy Canadian land. Go book on the subject, the world in 2050, talks about the new north. What's interesting about that package? This organization and who are the members? These are some of the best democracies, best run countries in the world, and they hold the fate of humanity in their hands. Seven great democracies and the Russians. <laughs> the new north. I'm going to wrap it up with one more section here. Security. I'll get done in about seven, eight minutes. I'm going to talk about America's greatest accomplishment. It was my third book, America in the World After Bush. I wrote a history of the United States. I said what America did to itself to make this multinational union, it decided to do the world after the Second World War. And the problem isn't that we failed. The problem is we succeeded. The American system, I'll define as states united, economies integrating. You work on a collective security principle. You encourage network transaction growth. It's good to have a competitive religious landscape. We do business with anybody. We got that from the Dutch, New Amsterdam, come New York. We have political pluralism based on a competitive religious landscape. America's changed their religion more frequently than any other society in the world. Eight members of my family, only one of them, born in Rhode Island, has been the same faith their entire life. If you know anything about Rhode Island, that makes sense. So you have a middle class ideology. You rule from the middle. Okay? This is Alexander Hamilton's notion. The name was given to it by Henry Clay from Kentucky. These are the parts that everybody likes because that makes globalization grow. The hard part is coming along on what comes with it. Com specifically, a competitive religious landscape. Because in most of the world, your religious identity is your national identity. And if you try to change your religion in many parts of the world, you can be put to death by your government. So how we form this union is crucial. 
You can't have political pluralism without pluralism and religion. You can't rule from the middle unless you have political pluralism. Religious competitive freedom is everything. America is the world's oldest multinational union. We got our currency in 1862. Until that point, we had 7,000 currencies in America. They were called banknotes. It was a note you got from your bank that was as good as far as you could throw it, basically. So no national currency until Lincoln invents it in 1862. Why does he do that? He's got to raise a lot of money real quick because he's fighting a war. So we've been doing globalization in miniature for a quarter of a millennium. Nobody has done it as long as we have. At the end of the Second World War, FDR wants to take his new deal to the world. It wasn't spread democracy, it was spread capitalism, free trade. He got that rule set from his cousin, Theodore. We succeed beyond our wildest dream. We integrate the West, one quarter of the world controlling two thirds of the wealth. The Chinese emulate us in the form of Deng's revolution. Now we talk globalization with a bottom billion disconnected. My point is that was all a conspiracy. Teddy Roosevelt, the open door. The notion is, as long as there's free trade, everything good else follows. The times we've gotten in trouble in our foreign policy is when we confuse things. We start thinking like Gorbachev. We start thinking it's the politics first and then the economics. And you don't want that. You want the economics first. I'll let them figure out the politics. So what happened? The glo global great divergence that occurred with colonialization. The West got rich, the rest got ripped off. That is healed by the American system coming into uh, uh, emergence. The rest over the 21st century basically outproduce, outgrow the West, two to one, and we call that the great convergence. So this notion you've been sold throughout most of your lives about the rising have, have not, disparity in the world is actually untrue. We are adding 70 million to a global middle class every year. The Economist says it's 60% of humanity at this point. Question is, can the West be an advocate and a participant in this process or are we doomed to aging? I'm going to show you something about the West and America and the rest of the world. Because America is the Dorian Gray of great powers. I'm going to give you mean age for a country representative of the continent. Africa is 18 years old, South Africa. Middle East is 22 years old, Saudi Arabia. South Asia is 24 years old, India. Brazil is 28 years old, Latin America. The United States is 36 years old right now, which is a great age. I remember 36. I loved it. China, coincidentally, is 36 years old. Then we're into the Russians turning 40, Europeans north of 40. Japan way north of 40. We are part of the old crowd, not part of the young crowd. But look what happens over the next four decades thanks to immigration and fertility. God bless those red state people. <laughs> I'm doing my share, you can do yours. <laughs> the United States hardly ages at all. China ages three years for every one year America ages over the next four decades. China is part of the old crew. We're still part of the young crew. That's a huge change. So when we talk about who's going to run the world in 2030, which is an obsession of mine, because I see all sorts of big trends coming about around 2030. The traditional contenders are the West. I'm telling you, the Europeans are lost to their project. They're getting old. Their militaries are shrinking. The Japanese haven't had a fight with anybody, haven't had a combat casualty since World War II. The Japanese came to Iraq, and we put the Dutch around them to make sure nothing would happen to them. <laughs> That's not an ally. That's a glass chin nervously extended. <laughs> so forget about them. Forget about the West. When the United States asks Dad if we can take the military out to do something in Syria, like we did with uh, David Cameron, I mean, that is us still doing that who's your daddy thing. 230 years after we got rid of Dad, we're still asking his permission to take the car out. The reality is, these are our allies of the future, but not all of them. The Russians are too much like Europe. Forget about it. The Brazilians are just so damn lucky. So who has million-man armies? Who's going to have them in the future? These three countries. 
no overseas bases, no experience doing combat since they fought those guys in 1962. Those guys worry mostly about the Chinese. We are the most experienced battle-tested military in the world and we are tired. We are in a fallow period because we overused our military for about eight years. Now we're underusing them for eight years. Why? Because we voted for them. We are gaining labor though while China loses labor and while India gains it dramatically. They're experiencing the economic demographic dividend that these guys had the last 40 years. They're expecting it and enjoying it for the next 40 years. India will have a bigger labor pool than China in 2030 and 50% more labor by 2050. When we talk about who's got expanding interests, no question, no question, and man are we tired. Who's got money to deal with the world? Because if you don't have money, you can't do this. We're going to have 60,000 per capita in 2030. Chinese will be up to 20. These guys will be up to 10, which is fairly rich. But where's the big rivalry between it? Isn't it between us and the Chinese? Don't we hate the Chinese? Don't the Chinese hate us? Turns out the Chinese are indifferent to us by and large. They admire our economy and our society. The real rivalry is between China and India over AVPAC, over the Indian Ocean, over Southeast Asia, Tibet that controls the headwaters for all the major rivers throughout Southeast Asia and in South Asia, which is why the Chinese are never, ever giving up Tibet. Forget that one. And a 1960 border war. It was just a clash, about 30,000 dead. So I'm gonna talk about three countries and three perceived trajectories here. I'm gonna keep it simple. Can you do stuff around the world? How does that change over time? The perception on America, you can watch it on Saturday Night Live every Saturday, is America's down the toilet and won't recover. We are small compared to everybody else who's surging. It's a flat world, we're getting old and heavy. I'm telling you the fracking revolution is gonna lead to an industrial renaissance. We are at an inflection point that's gonna happen in the next 10 years, gonna put us back very much on top. But for now, that's the dominant perspective. With the Chinese, the perspective is they're gonna grow forever. There are predictions by credible economists that the Chinese will have an economy 40 times the size of the United States mid-century, which is nutty. It's really nutty. I talked about those walls they're gonna hit. China's gonna peak out at a certain point and then settle into more normal growth. The reality we face now is we think this is scary when they're perceived to be passing us. Wait until they perceive us to be passing them. We need a Nixon now to rationalize this relationship so we can have a Reagan later. I don't say it's a Democrat or Republican, male or woman or female. I'm not saying it's gonna be a color of a skin or an argument about political philosophy. We need somebody to rationalize our relationship with China like Nixon did, and then we need somebody that helps us re-embrace a more vigorous role. But here's the two main concepts again. When you throw the Indians in, the assumption is the Indians are a pale imitation of China. I made the point about the demographic dividend. They're gonna take off dramatically the next 20 years. What is manufacturing in China today becomes manufacturing in India, which means the Indians have to have good relations with the Chinese because they go from manufacturing to ownership. So here we have these three countries all coming together around 2030. And it's sort of like the joke about the three guys sitting around the campfire and the bear walks up. Two guys get up ready to run. Third guy sits there calmly, puts on his shoes. Two guys ask the third guy, why are you putting on your shoes? The guy says, I don't have to outrun the bear. <laughs> it's not about who gets to 2030 fastest. It's about who gets to 2030 with the least amount of damage. Or as Indiana Jones said, it's not the years, honey, it's the mileage. It's all about who processes the angry populism. Huge here, huge here, fairly significant here. Who am I betting on? I'm betting on the country that already has a democracy, because that can process populist anger faster. I'm betting on the country that's processed populist anger three or four times in its history. So I like our chances dramatically against these two. These guys have the toughest road to hoe. 